team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. One of the best things you can do to learn any kind of art is to learn portraiture. Portraiture informs so much. Of course, self-portraiture is great too. If you really want to get it down, the best way to start is with a limited palette. And that's what Jennifer Balkin's going to teach you here today. Hi, I'm Jennifer Balkin and welcome to my workshop. In this workshop, I plan to show you how I use my chromatic limited palette. I love using color. In my own work, I seek to augment um, nature a bit by injecting my paintings with a little more saturated color than really exists. I believe that I can create um, the illusion of a little more vibrancy and, and life uh, than I actually see. Okay, now I'm going to take you through some of the materials and tools that I use when I'm painting a portrait. So first I've got my, my paint tubes over here, all of my colors, and you'll see me squeeze them out shortly. Um, but uh, the, the paint tubes, the colors I use are um, a primary red, a primary yellow, and an ultramarine blue, plus titanium white. Um, and these particular colors, which you'll, which you'll see shortly, um, are really true to their color integrity. And what I mean by that is that um, um, I'm you know, really going for a red that doesn't lean too far to orange or get too warm um, or lean too far blue and get too cool. So that's what I like about these. Um, and plus I've got a uh, transparent oxide uh, red color which, I'll, which will serve as my my under sketch color for my monochromatic part, stage of the painting. So in regards to brushes, I like to use a variety of uh, shape, size, and quality of hair in, in my brushes. Um, I think having variety makes for different kinds of stroke quality. Uh, I predominantly use um, filberts, that, which have these, this little round tip to them, roundish. Um, and, and then flats that have a more of a sharp, chiseled edge to them. And occasionally I'll use a fan brush. And um, what I really like about these particular brushes is that I can load up a lot of paint um, and apply a, a good solid stroke with them. Um, and <clears throat> they, hold, they hold the paint pretty nicely. Um, Depending on the quality of the hair will we'll also determine a different kind of stroke. Um, and uh, the fan brush is nice for doing some, some edge work that you'll see me do. Um, one thing that I think is really important in, in brushes is that you start with, uh, well, a after you sketch with maybe a smaller, smaller tip brush, you start with as big a brush as possible in laying down your paint. And then as you get um, further along in your portrait, uh, that your, your, brush, your brush size goes down a little bit and, um, and you're able to do some more refined work. And then um, next I've got a palette knife. And um, really with my knife, I, I predominantly use that for mixing paint and laying it down. I don't do a whole lot of knife work in my canvas. 
And then I've got a, a solvent here for cleaning between strokes. Um, I've got a medium. This is walnut oil. And um, frankly, I don't use it a whole lot. And, I, and I, in, when I teach painting, I encourage students to not rely too much on medium. I, I think that we get into a dependency on medium, and it thins out the paint. And, um, and then your strokes just don't look as um, bold and strong if you're relying on medium. So that's there just to uh, maybe to thin out some paint that I, that I need to loosen. But for the most part, I'm just using paint. And then next, I've got this little pocket mirror. I'll show you my fancy little pocket mirror. Um, and this is invaluable. When I'm in my studio at home, I work. I will work with a um, full-length mirror behind me at all times. It, it lives there, and so what that does for me is that um, it enables me to see a reverse image of my work, uh, as well as add a little distance to it um, too. When we're when you're looking at your work for hours and uh, looking at it in a particular orientation, it's really tough to see any problem areas or any mistakes that you might make. And so um, if you, you know, some people choose to flip their painting upside down. Um, I like looking at the reverse image and find that, you know, uh, basically I'll, I'll lay a couple of strokes down and then turn around, look at the reverse image. And I mean, I do that probably every several strokes I make. And, um, <clears throat> and it's great because I can suddenly see um, poor measurement, incorrect value. And, uh, and also, if I'm lazy and don't feel like getting up a whole lot, I automatically add a few feet of distance between um, the image that I see and my work, um, which is great because it's really good to get some distance from your work every, every so often. And so those are my main materials that I use all the time while I'm, while I'm painting um, alone. When I'm teaching, and I'll talk about these uh, later as well, I like to use a value viewer right here, um, uh, predominantly for this gradation from um, 1 to 10. And this is a really useful tool in the classroom where I break down uh, my values into their lights, their middles, and their darks. I also have a color wheel that I have made with my paints. So this is the red I use, the yellow I use, and the blue I use. And I'll get into that a lot later. But I use that um, in, in the classroom as well. And then a couple other things that are handy for talking about um, portrait painting. Um, I've got a planes of the head, a John Asaro planes of the head model right here, which is um, really, really useful to help students understand the structure of the human head. And then I've got a, um, a model of a skull. And um, my skull over here um, is great because we can, you know, we can get a sense for what lies underneath the skin. And um, we all have a unique, um, I mean, we all have the same anatomy, but we have a unique structure and topography, and the result of which is what causes uh, our, our unique shadow shapes. Next, I'll talk about setting up and lighting my model that I'm going to be painting today. All right, now today I'm going to be discussing how I choose my painting subject. And when I choose my subject, I like to seek a variety in in choosing my model in terms of complexion and age and gender. Um, just, uh, I really think that it's important to be able to paint anybody. And, um, and with my palette, with this chromatic limited palette, um, you can be, mix up anybody's skin color. So, so there's no limitations on that. So uh, today I'm going to be painting um, Siang. Gomez, who uh, has become a friend and model, and, uh, and I'll talk about um, why, or uh, the, the position she's going to be posing in while I'm painting her. And so I've had Siang, um, first off, uh, put on a red dress and have a nice little red orchid in her hair. Um, I was thinking about, so she's light complected um, on the little pinkish side. And so I thought it would be really nice to have some vibrant color 
that could reflect off of her a little bit and, 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 and have, a nice, um, have some nice contrast there. She's, uh, she's sitting in front of a mid-tone to dark valued fabric that's fairly neutral. Uh, also wanted to play with a color, color and value that would, would be a nice contrast to her and what she's wearing. So with that red dress, I'm going to sort of play on some compliments into the background. Um, another thing about background that I'll talk about a lot uh, when I get into um, the when I get into painting color is that in order to really make to really feel like my subject is in space, is there's space around her, there's atmosphere, and she's not just superimposed in front of uh, some background or color, I'm going to be bringing in some of those um, desaturated neutrals of the background into some of her um, midtones, particularly. Some of those form-turning areas of shape that, that need to desaturate and cool off a little bit. So, so that'll, that'll come into play. So there'll be a relationship between um, the foreground and the background. So as far as her position today, um, though she's wearing this, this adorable Hawaiian dress, we're not really going to get much of that. Um, what I'm interested in, I mean, basically, as you, as you can see, I've got a 20 by 16 uh, panel here. And I'm most interested in, in getting her, her head features um, and just a little bit of her bust, basically, uh, shoulders and uh, some, a little bit of neckline there. So, so we're not, we're not going to really see much of that dress other than the straps, which I found to be, um, uh, to be a nice um, embellishment to the portrait, um, as well as the little flowers. So there's, there's some red um, playing off one another. And so as far as her body position, um, let's see. So right now she's facing, you know, everything is facing forward to me. And I think it's a bit more interesting in a portrait or in a, even in a figurative pose when um, the head is in a slightly different orientation than the body. So I think what I'm going to have Sion do is uh, turn, turn her face a little bit here. Great. So what I'm going for with her um, head turn is I, I want to be able to see a little bit of shadow along her, uh, along her cheek. And you know, they, they typically call this um, a three-quarters lighting effect. And it's a really, I think, can be a successful way to create the illusion of three dimension in a portrait. So I see, I see um, some ear in shadow on one side and um, not on the other. So basically, I see more of one part of her face than the other part. And the part that I see more of, I have some shadow and I have some midtone. So I think that, that uh, provides a nice um, effect in creating a, a strong portrait. So now, um, so now her head is turned away from, in, in a different um, direction than her, her figure. But I think I'm going to make it even a little more dramatic by having her turn, Sian, if you would, um, um, scooch your, your, your figure a little bit in that direction, yes. Okay, and now turning head back to it was. So, uh, so this is nice. Um, also, I see that we have um, a dark, darker side that her, uh, her head and, and, and figure and torso are casting on the fabric behind her. And, um, and we really have like a nice dissipation of, of light moving across her upper body. So, that is a nice segue to talking about light and shadow, which uh, I'm about to do. So I like to start by saying that my approach to painting anything, um, be it inanimate or animate, is to break down the wealth of information I see um, into a more simplified, abstract pattern of shape. So I'm taking a lot of vi visual three-dimensional stimuli and lessening them or simplifying them. And I find that this idea really demystifies 
the whole process of trying to paint a thing to look like a thing. Um, I always tell my students that uh, behind every strong representational painting lies a strong abstract foundation. Really getting the likeness of anything requires us to, um, to break down information and reduce it to a, a, a smaller number of values than we actually see. And we do this by squinting, something that I will be doing throughout my whole painting process and that I constantly remind people to do. So, uh, and what, what that is, is uh, either, either one can squint their eyes, take off their glasses perhaps, um, blur their vision out, and, and this really helps you see the essentials. It gets rid of a lot of detail that can be distracting. In regards to what I'm doing today, I'm obviously painting human subject matter, but I, I really like to emphasize that it doesn't matter what I'm painting. Um, and I think what, what this does is takes away that fear of that, oh gosh, I've got to paint eyes and a nose and it has to look like a person. And, um, well, it, we, can, we can do that w and, and uh, detangle that association between having something need, needing to look like something recognizable, but just let's, let's make it abstract. So you've got this flat panel or canvas or whatever you're working on, um, and you look up front at your subject, what, what you see, squint your eyes, and break that information down into five or seven values, perhaps. And now, lay those values down on your, on your panel. And so, with precision of, of line and mark making and correct measurement and really getting your value on point on your paper or your canvas, you, you, you look down at what you have, and then this interesting pattern of abstract shape becomes something recognizable to you. So suddenly you see, oh wow, this looks like her face, or this looks like this interior that I was trying to do. And you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. You've turned your, your uh, 2D flat panel into something that um, appears to be three-dimensional. And that essentially is representational art. We are painting a thing to look like a thing, and how do we do it? I like thinking about it like that because I find that um, it's, it can be very d intimidating. And, um, and this, I, I really believe, de-intimidates all of it. I am painting light and shadow. And I like to say that I'm not painting the color of the skin, the color of the flesh, but I'm painting the color of the light across um, my human subject, or the, the form. So um, here, I'm gonna use my uh, John Asaro Planes of the Head model as my, uh, as my subject to talk about light and shadow. As light falls across the subject, note the differences in, in uh, light and shadow and value change that happens. So we've got a light source coming from about over here and um, with that, um, you'll, you'll notice some of the strongest light, the, the greatest illumination is happening um, right about here, right about top of his head and his forehead, so closest to our light source. And as we go down, um, going across his form, the light's a little weaker. And we have, so we have less light as it's farther away from, uh, from our one direct source. And so, uh, so you can see how the changes in planes of his head, we've got our front planes, our side planes, our top planes, um, those values, the degree of light to dark, change as a function of distance and of shape, of the, the turning of, you know, of, of this particular topography here. There are two kinds of shadows. There is uh, cast shadow and form shadow. And I'll talk about cast shadow for a second. Uh, so cast shadow happens when um, light is falling across a form and that, you know, a feature, that form, actually obstructs the light and causes a shadow to happen beneath it. So you can see here, for example, um, a, a nice cast shadow happening under his nose. Light is hitting nose 
and this whole area, basically the underneath plane of the nose, is obstructing light from passing over onto here. So we have this dark shadow, a cast shadow. Another kind of shadow is form shadow. And form shadow happens when light falls across a form and moves into shadow. So basically uh, falls across a round form. And so we can see it happening on his forehead. We go from light to shadow as we turn the form. Now, um, Mr. Planes of the Head is very angular. <laughs> so a lot more angular than a, you know, a, a person that we would come in contact with. So we don't really have nice, smooth, transitions that we'd see in an actual uh, person. So, you know, comparing, comparing the skull to planes of the head man, um, obviously, ac actually right here is a great little shot because you have light hitting the skull and we're moving into shadow right here and it's really smooth. And that little area between light and shadow is neither um, is neither in the light nor is it in the dark, and we call that halftone. Um, so it's, it's a transition between the light and the dark. So here we go, we move into form shadow, and you know, we can see form shadow uh, elsewhere on this bony guy <laughs> happening like right along this, this uh, cheekbone here, and a wee bit of transition. It's a little, it's also a bit, a bit um, bony and angular. Um, so there you have it. There you have your, uh, your two kinds of shadow, cast shadow and form shadow. As form turns away from the light into shadow, um, it will decrease, well, it, it, uh, as, as I've been saying, it goes down in value, but it also cools in temperature and uh, loses chroma as well, so it desaturates. It desaturates and cools, which isn't um, totally relevant when we're talking about monochrome, but we'll talk about that a lot later in color. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that's important to think about. So things just change as they go off into the distance. All right, now let's talk about color and mixing paint using a primary uh, chromatic palette, limited palette. So um, I want to talk about the color wheel. And the color wheel is something that many of you have probably seen and made as kids. And, um, and so this will be kind of familiar to you. And so here I have a color wheel that I made. Um, and I'm actually using the, the particular paints that I use all the time in making this wheel. So I've got my primary red, my primary yellow, and my primary blue, which is an ultramarine blue. In order to make this wheel, I added a little bit of white to the blue, and that's because uh, ultramarine blue is a transparent color, and so it comes out of the tube uh, very darkly. So I add a little bit of white just to get it about the same value as the red. And then red and yellow are opaque, so they're, they're fine standing alone. And so with, this, with these three um, triadic primaries, I then mix them to make what are, what are known as complements or secondary colors. So yellow, blue, we've got green. Red and yellow, we have orange. And red and blue, we have violet. And so there, there you've got the opposing colors. And then I went further and created what are known as tertiary colors. And so tertiaries are sort of the, the warm and the cool versions of the primaries. So you see a orangey yellow and then a greenish yellow and so forth around, around the wheel. And so something um, that's to, to take from this is that um, the way to, these are, this is all very, very saturated color, and the way to desaturate any of these colors is to add its opposite to it. So whereas um, you'll see you know, some painters actually adding gray, maybe a mixture of black and white, to their saturated color to get um, a more a neutral version, 
I prefer to use the colors opposite. So in order to create a grayed down red, I would add some green to it. And so basically there's this, there's this continuum from primary to secondary color um, in which when perfectly mixed in equal quantities, in the middle you'll get a gray desaturated, you know, a brownish gray. And so uh, theoretically, any of these crossings, you should come up with nearly the same um, grayish brown, completely neutral color in the middle. Doesn't really happen, but, um, but it, it's, it, it's close. You, you, no, no matter what, you get grayed down versions of all of these. And so with this palette of only jewel colors, um, the, the key is to work toward making desaturated colors, so actually making your earth tones. So why do I use all these jewel tones um, and I choose to make my earth tones? I mix a lot. It's all about mixing when you only have a few colors to work with. Um, the reason is I find that you can get richness in your work when you're only using jewel colors. Um, there's sometimes there's a deadening of color that happens when there's too much earthy, muddy uh, colors into your, that are mixed into your colors. And so with this palette, um, it's hard to do that. And, and often I, I find students will start out getting, being a little too chromatic. And frankly, I prefer them to err on the side of chroma than, than dullness. So, so with this palette, um, it's the, the biggest challenge is to, is to create muted color. And frankly, that's pretty much like what you're doing all the time. Uh, in life, you know, as we look around wherever, wherever we are, most color is desaturated, certainly when you're working on um, flesh tones. And, uh, and the real saturated color we see in, in clothing, and even after clothing's been washed a few times, your reds are never that red, your blues are never that blue. So, so I'm constantly thinking about opposites while I mix paint. Um, and, you know, again, uh, opposites because I'm trying to say desaturate a purple and um, and you know the interesting thing about for example purple and yellow is that a purple and yellow combination is really raw umber so um, so yeah so uh, so earth tones can all be made from from just this so as I said there are um, no earth tones, so there's no black. So, uh, so what I do is I create a color that approximates black. So I'm, I'm basically trying to convince the viewer that something is black, um, and I'll show you how I do that in a little bit. So visual harmony can readily happen here, and uh, visually, visual harmony is the phenomenon that uh, takes place when color, color combinations are visually pleasing to us. And this idea of visual harmony is happening because, as I said earlier, we're using all of our colors, just different, um, different concentrations of them. And so what happens is when, you know, for example, if I am setting out to paint some flesh on, say, a light-complected person's cheek that's maybe sort of a pinkish-orangish color, I'll, I'll use a bit of white, um, a little bit of red, a little bit of yellow, and I'll mix that up and I'll come up with um, a somewhat um, peachy color, perhaps, that's really, really saturated, a very punchy color that's not quite natural to skin tone. And the way to cut the chroma, what, you know, what I would think about it theoretically is if I have a uh, pinkish, yellowish tone that I need to desaturate, I want to desaturate it with a greenish purplish tone so but in my three colors um, what I have to do is add the third color that's what I have left so I cut chroma always by adding the third color which in that case would be a little dot of blue and you'll see as I'm mixing that you you develop a sense for how much you need to create the desired mix. It's really, really easy, especially in the early days of doing this, to go overboard and um, create uh, 
mixes that are way off the mark of what you had intended. And and I encourage, I always encourage people just to start off really sparingly with your with your mixes. Um, I liken it to making soup in which you have to be very careful about some of your seasonings because if you put a little too much salt in, you've blown it. So painting is similar. So this limited palette, as I said, can be a really tough palette to get a good handle on. Um, it is hard to mute colors, but it is very doable. And the more you use it, the better you get. And, um, and one, one amazing thing out of uh, getting you know, achieving a competence over this palette and, or mastery is that you will have the ability to mix anything. And I really find that it's, uh, it's, it's a superpower. It's like an amazing feat to be able to do that, to be able to um, identify just about anything you see and decide, oh, okay, how do I replicate that in paint? And if you can, if you can make mixes out of just these few paints, then you will, you really will be able to mix anything you see. It's all about identifying the family or the hue of the color um, first. And once you, once you identify what family or hue that color belongs in, um, then you think about what value it is, how light or, light or dark it is, and you just start adjusting and adding a little, little bits more chroma into it. Um, temperature. Uh, how temperature is relative. So um, something is only light, or excuse me, something is only cool or warm um, as a function of what it's next to. Only so cool if it's next to something warm. So just to show you a, a very, very small sample of what you can mix, it's, I mean, it's pretty limitless, but uh, I've, I did these, um, these little uh, palette examples for uh, a couple different classes just to, just to show people the variety and the mutedness and sort of the pastelized versions of, of some of these mixtures. So I just grouped them roughly in light, in middle tone, and in shadow tone. And so there's, you know, there's quite a range of, uh, of, of color and possibilities you can, you can get with this palette. Um, this over here, I did, I did this kind of little interesting little exercise in which I actually looked at a painting after I had finished it um, and went back and mixed up all, like, all of the variety of paint strokes, discrete paint mixes that I had laid down after the fact, um, just out of, I, don't know, I guess, curiosity of how much I actually used. And so, again, grouped by light, middle, and dark. And I was um, impressing upon students on, again, the, the incredible range you can get and, and the ability to um, desaturate tone into earth tones that you can certainly buy at the store or happily mix them with this palette. So my approach to laying down paint is using a technique known as optical mixing or applying broken color. And by this, I mean that I um, create strokes that differ in temperature, chroma, and um, value, and alternate them in, in a certain way. So basically, I'm alternating um, saturation, color level, and temperature as I'm descending or ascending over a form. And this, and this um, when seen together at a little bit of a distance, creates the illusion of three-dimensional form or form turning. Um, this is a technique that was invented by the Impressionists of the late 1800s, like Monet and Van Gogh and Fetchen, for just for a, a few examples. And it's funny to think about a, a technique like this being invented, but, uh, but they were some of the first to, to use this kind of uh, method. And I just, um, this, this kind of um, portrayal of color and value and in representational art um, is just super exciting for me. I love being able to um, look, at a, look at a painting almost as if it's a puzzle. 
in which each discrete stroke uh, can't quite stand alone, though it has its own weight, but when seen together in combination, um, you see this beautiful image emerge. And so it's this, this whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. Um, the way, you know, I think a lot about uh, the emotion of the sitter and just, uh, just the, the energy behind painting a human subject. And so as I very deliberately lay down these strokes, I'm, I'm thinking about the layering of human skin, both uh, metaphorically and physically. So this, this approach really, really speaks to me. And I get super, super excited by work that I, that I see that is really uh, rich and bold in, in form and, and, and holds together with strength. And then upon viewing it up close, as I get closer and closer, I can see these beautiful, discrete little pieces of paint that, um, that almost have a mosaic-like quality to them. And for some, um, you know, for some artists, that is not the end in, in and of itself. That might be like three quarters of the way into their final painting, um, in which they prefer to blend, blend paint and make things really smooth. Um, for me, that, that spot is my happy place. And uh, I, I laugh in my class and, <laughs> and, um, and say that bl um, blending is for mixed drinks and margaritas and not, not for painting. So anyway, <laughs> that, uh, with that in mind, um, I will show you a couple of uh, samples of my work and just, you know, and just kind of um, uh, identify some, some of this optical blending technique that I, that I do and that I'll be um, doing when I'm painting. Um, so, oops, uh, for example here, this is, a, this is an interesting little study that I did because I first um, painted Kelly in full monochrome with seven, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, yep, seven, seven values I painted her in. And I wanted to demonstrate how, um, how, a, you know, how a great likeness can be achieved with um, a reduced number of values that are in monochrome. And then I did a color version of that. And, you know, base, and really, really tried to, st to uh, st stay grounded in my, um, my value structure when moving into color. But so if we, if we look at, um, if we look closely at some of these colors and strokes that I applied, you can see, like for example, coming around her cheek, um, some really, really warm, warm, hot, even um, color, chromatic color, warm color, and that's dark in value. And then as we move across, we get a little cooler, we get a little warmer, we get cooler, warmer, cool, and, and, and the value is, is getting higher as we go. So to create this illusion of form turn. Here on my model Lisa's, um, in, this, in this particular little portrait study, um, we've got this looking at Lisa's forehead, which uh, is very round. And, so, and, and these are some much bigger, looser strokes that I lay down. But again, um, going from shadow side, into, into light, moving a half tone that's cooler, a little warmer, that actually gets a little darker um, and less saturated on that top plane of her head. So you can, you can I, I've really parsed out the plane work here in this particular study. So, so you know, again, if you, you know, look very closely at, at this image, you can see a lot of discrete strokes there. Um, but when we pull away from it, um, it gets, gets tighter in view. And it's, you know, what's interesting is that in our days of um, posting artwork all the time and consuming artwork on social media, so many times we see images of paintings um, that are the size of our cell screens, <laughs> cell phone screens. And, and that work uh, looks so tight and, you know, it's really, really tough to see strokes. And, and it's funny when, you know, if I'm seeing, actually discovering somebody else's work, 
uh, and I, that I get to actually see in life or, or see a bigger version and realize, oh my gosh, like look at all those strokes that I couldn't even see in that small image. And I think that happens with my work as well. As you tighten it up it, um, or, or reduce its size, you, can't, you can no longer see all those discrete strokes, but, but they're there. Okay, after all that talk about color, we are now ready to do some mixing and mix up the palette. Now to the palette. So um, at this point, I'm going to squeeze out all of my tubes of paint and then with that, create mixtures based on uh, value, color, and temperature. Um, and then, oh, well, uh, I will categorize them into three parts. So my lights will be on one side, my middles will be on another, and then my, um, my shadows will be on the third. So firstly, let me squeeze some paint out here. Here goes for my titanium white. And I always encourage people to be really generous with their paint. I'm going to put a lot of it in there. Okay, there's the first one. Secondly, for my primary yellow. Third, I've got my primary red. And last, I have ultramarine blue. And I, I <clears throat> like I said, I encourage uh, students to use a lot of paint um, and not to ever use student grade. Student grade is cheaper because it has less pigment in it. And so ultimately, it's harder to create good mixes since there's less pigment. And um, eventually you'll be spending more money because you'll just need more of that paint. So I am not going to be using that transparent oxide red anymore. Uh, that was for um, my uh, preliminary under sketch, understudy part. And now it is all jewel colors. Um, I, want, I want that students create their, uh, their earth tones and their desaturated tones. And I, um, already talked a lot about that, so we're just going to get right to the mixing at this point. So um, here we go. All right. So uh, first thing is, um, just like I said uh, when I just just like I talked about um, in when I was talking about light shadow and value simplification on on getting averages, um, that's pretty much what I'm going for now. So. So I'm looking at um, uh, my model and, and deciding, um, based on her complexion, uh, you know, about what, what uh, hue, what family of color I'm going to be using for each of these categories. And, um, and so, and um, as, as stated, I am not really looking for the absolute lightest nor the absolute darkest within a category of, of tone, but, um, but somewhere average. And then, then across each category, I'm going to create a um, somewhat uh, warmer versions of, of that color, uh, or I should say of that value, and some cooler versions of that value, and just slight variations in value so that you have a little bit to work with. Um, I'm looking at my model and deciding sort of an overall um, uh, flesh in light complexion tone, uh, um, how chromatic that is, what, what value it is, how warm or cool that is. It's important when I'm uh, painting my flesh and light uh, tones that I start with a nice big helping of white for a light-complected person like Sion. Um, you know what? By the way, I am a little chilly, and um, it's very important that you're always comfortable when you're painting, so allow me to put on my jacket right now. All right, so here is my white, nice big helping of white. And um, I am going to lay in a little bit of red.
You can see how pink that gets. And a little bit of yellow. So right now, I'm, I'm going for um, trying to get the value, uh, the average value that I see. And I'd say that's about a, approximately a two-ish or so on my value scale. And so here, um, as I said earlier, now I have a really chromatic color. And that is definitely not um, too natural looking when it comes to skin. Now, when using a limited palette of just a few, uh, the, the way to cut, cut chroma or desaturate is just adding a little bit of the third color. So the third, the third is my blue. And I'll just wipe this off so I can keep, try to keep my little pools of paint clean. Um, and now, I'll grab a little, a little bit of blue, and you can see how little I'm using. Um, I start, I, I try using it very sparingly as to not completely ruin a mix, um, because as you can see, as I'm mixing, a little goes a long way. So amazing how just adding that blue, I cooled it off, and I created something that looks a lot more natural, a lot more, um, of a believable skin tone. I think I'll add just a little bit more yellow, just so it's a little less pink. So that's, kind of, that's pretty much what you're doing. You're just you know, adding little bits and little bits until you get at something that approximates what you see up there. So, so here's sort of my starter color. And um, I'm going to kind of create a little string of um, of color here. So I'll create something that's maybe a, a wee bit warmer over here. Warmer um, by adding some yellow, a little more yellow. I will create something a bit cooler by adding a little more blue. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of attaching or stringing them together, I should say. Now that went a little too blue in my opinion. So, let me, how do I bring it back? I bring it back with adding a little, dipping into my, um, my red again. Yeah. So, it becomes a little, it becomes an art form in and of itself, creating these, um, these subtle changes. As I'm looking at my model's complexion, I'm seeing, um, you know, a, a, some, some real subtle greens, too. So, let me sort of add to that and create some subtle greens. So you can see how these are all very similar values and just slightly different, um, uh, slightly different colors. I'll grab some more white, put it up top here, and create even a lighter value. All right, so I, I think I have a nice, some nice um, variation here in light. Next, I'm going to uh, create some uh, some mixes for my middle tone. And I'll start off by creating some, again, some warm tone. And, and where, I, where I actually see this uh, is, you know, so, is uh, uh, where um, the turning of form happens, um, where, you know, light goes into shadow and, and this area becomes some middle tone. I see middle tone happening in, you know, within the eye structure, some middle, there's a lot of turning of form that requires some, some middle tone. And, you know, there's some, there's some warmer middle tones within the eye structure. There's some cooler uh, coming around the, the turning of the nose and so forth. And even, even as, we, as we move uh, down the jaw, 
we get some, um, you know, also some light middle. With middle, I'm gonna just take a little bit of white and decent amount of red and some yellow, and look at that, that is bright. I have a little more white, lighten that up a bit. And a little bit of blue to cut the chroma. So I'm just still playing until I until I get something that I think will be useful in my portrait here. A little more blue, cool it off, cut the chroma a little bit, okay. All right, look at that. So you can see how things are starting to get, in, in these middles, things are getting a little um, uh, kind of mauve-y, uh, a little more muted, which is what I want. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm just, I'm creating, I'm creating some um, darker versions of some of this stuff in the light. So again, a little string of them. All right, um, now let me get some nice cools happening. I've got a bunch of warms, so throw some white over there and pop some blue in right away. Wow, that's a vivid blue. And you can see how I'm just dabbing at my, you know, each of these colors. So, you know, for me to say, to describe what I put in all of these mixes, I'm, you know, I'd just be repeating myself over and over because I'm, I'm putting the same, same colors in all the mixes, but I'm just using um, different concentrations of them. And that really just comes with practice, like you know, knowing just how much to use in, in whatever mix you're making. I'm gonna go for a kind of a greenish one. That's very yellow. So now that I have the green, how do I cut it? I take red to gray it down. And that grays down nicely. I've been told that my palette, um, <laughs> my palette in this stage looks like a, um, uh, a makeup counter like at the mall, like, <laughs> which I think is sort of a compliment because I always, I don't know, they always look very yummy to me. All right, so, yeah, so I, you know, you can still, you can, you can just play and play and mix and mix and, and get at making these grays. Um, uh, the more you know, white white dilutes, as I said uh, earlier today, um, and so so adding little bits of white to these mixes without getting you know, too light in value um, will also enable you to uh, get some more muted tones as well. So here's you know, so here I've got some stuff to to to, to go with in my middle middle category. And, um, and now I will um, get into my, uh, my shadows. So first, so this time I will not start with adding white, or, or, or I, sh I should say with uh, starting with white, but I will um, start with uh, everything but that since we're going with shadow. So here we go, and look at that fire engine red which looks like a crazy shadow color, but you'll see how fast it disappears with the help of my blue. And one thing so I, I find you know, really fun about um, doing all this mixing 
with minimal stuff is you can you know you just watch you watch the colors evolve and uh, look at that look how muted that um, that orange got now let me um, actually let me make up a darker kind of a darker brown there we go R more of a reddish brown there and even a even a darker one with a, just a little less yellow. So who needs earth colors? I'm making them. Um, all right, maybe something a little yellower. So here I go. I'm making um, I'm making a purple. Making up a purple, and then. I cut my purple chroma when I add some green, and that ends up being a really like a really nice earthy, earthy tone. So, um, so you know, speaking of relationships between light, um, light and shadow on human flesh, often you see you know if you see a if you see this uh, a somewhat pinkish, slightly pinkish um, skin tone. You're likely to have you're you're likely to think about the skin tone and shadow as a little greenish, like if you know thinking in terms of those opposites, and um, and you know when I say greenish, I mean like you know a very desaturated green, but nonetheless it's still in the in the green family. So that is um, you know I think it's helpful to think about uh, think about color like that. Okay, so something that I see um, that I will use a lot is sort of a, um, some some deep some deep reds. Uh, when painting when painting flesh, and you get into those little creases and crevices that um, all of us have. Um, the older we get, the more we have. <laughs> but uh, but getting getting into those really dark dark little bits of um, in inside some of the eye structure, uh, around nostrils, corners of mouth um, that are fairly dark, but they're also very warm. Sometimes people make the mistake of getting a little cool in those areas. They think about them as dark, so they must be, I don't know, kind of bluish or you know, deep dark. Um, and the cooler you make those areas, I think, the less alive your your subject looks so it's real important to think about you know just think about the the blood flow there and why those areas should be warm and also in some of those little creased areas um, that are that are real deep and deep and dark they're catching reflected light from a neighboring either a fold of skin. Or, um, or just a neighboring um, facial feature. And so skin reflecting on skin is going to be warm. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, um, one last thing I'm going to um, premix is uh, some hair color. And um, so I can get a really nice, I'll put a real dark down here, really nice dark color with my, a lot of blue, a little red, and to cut, you know, just to sort of de-purple it, a tiny bit of yellow. I don't want to do too much yellow because yellow is light, and that'll lighten us a little too much. But you can see here, wow, look at that. It's like a deep, dark brown that works for a lot of, I think, my model's hair color. This is a good place to just uh, start. Um, and I'm, as I'm speaking, I just realized that I forgot something. Um, I'm concentrating on her flesh and her hair, and I forgot um, what she's wearing, and, um, and also the flower in her hair. So we've got a lot of red, red on that. And so um, anyway, actually, this deep red works for some of that, um, for some of the darker parts of the red. But um, I'm, I'm painting a uh, sort of a, I guess, a middle, middle tone red. Um, some lighter bits of red uh, around the flower, and uh, also along um, 
the straps, the little bows where, or the, the, the tied straps that are closer to the light, they have a, uh, they've, they've got some uh, uh, lighter tone red. And then you can see the underside of those, which are red in shadow. So all that said, I will just create a couple of pre-mixed colors on that note. Um, red is hard to lighten. You know, only certain reds maintain their integrity of staying red and not, mo and not moving to pink so quickly. And I have to say, this particular red that I use has, um, you know, is, is, is great because it does not move to pink too quickly. And so I also don't want it to be too chromatic. So here we go. So this is, uh, that could work. Um, and then just to get a, uh, a red in shadow, a little, little pre-mixed action there, um, a red and blue which is kind of what I did over here. I guess, I guess I'm just adding to it a little bit. So there'll be a few different tones, but, um, but uh, that's something, something to work with. Okay, so you can see here uh, in my pre-mix palette that there's, um, there is some organization, um, and uh, it will not stay like that. Um, I, you know, everything start out lovely and categorized, and in the course of the painting, they all kind of start dancing together and, and combine. Well, now I have my colors mixed on my palette, so I'm ready to start laying in some color. One thing that I uh, haven't done yet that I'd like to do is uh, get in some background color information um, really before I start laying in the flesh. And, uh, and that'll, you know, that'll really help me to um, continue to get my values right by having this contrast between background and uh, foreground. So, let us see how huh, to do now. I'll grab this brush. And so I've got a, uh, I've got a grayish background here, um, kind of a gray, dark middle, I'm gonna call it. So I'm going to create that with, let's see, put that over here since it's sort of a dark tone. Grab my, my blue and my red. Go for um, now getting the value right. and dechromatizing some of that, uh, let's see, not so bad. And, um, all right. And that might be a little, a little bit dark, but uh, I'll just lay something down and uh, continue to adjust it later, but um, but um, right now, what's really important to me is uh, describing this background, you know, sort of immediately around the contour of uh, of my model, so so I can really you know really try to get that uh, the edge looking to be where where it is. And notice how I'm laying the paint down, guys. Um, picking up a lot of paint on my brush, and you know, really just uh, laying down a solid stroke. It's looking a, it's looking a little blue. I think I want to um, gray it down even a little more. That's a little grayer. All right. There we go. 
Yeah. So I'm just going to delicately, you know, I'm not, I'm not, there's a, there's a lot, there's that line you can see from my last uh, painting. And um, I feel like uh, what I'm, what I'm laying in now is a little more true to what I see at this moment. And, you know, there's always, always subtle changes, um, between pose sittings and that's totally okay. It's part of the process. And so when I do get, uh, get to bring paint over here, I'll, I'll show you how I, um, I, try to uh, create a soft edge, um, you know, where paint meets paint. That's important to me. One thing is that the background on this side of my picture is a little lighter than on the left side because of this um, deep shadow behind her that's happening. So, you know what, maybe I will. I will get that little bit of, like, especially in that negative space um, next to her neck. That would be nice to get a dark, a dark in there. And here, for the first time, I'm just going to take a little dip into my oil, um, just so that I can just spread this around a little bit quickly. So, you know, notice that um, between strokes, I really try to clean my brush well as to not make mud on my palette. Um, when I switch I'll switch brushes when I want to switch size, but not necessarily, or brush texture, but not necessarily um, between colors. So I just like to make sure that I've cleaned it, um, cleaned my brush enough. All right, so now, now is where I will uh, begin to lay some um, flesh and light color in. And, um, dipping into the piles I just created. So what I'll do is, out of, out of these various um, subtle, different flesh and light colors that I made, su subtly different, I should say, uh, flesh and light colors that I made, I will be laying them down, paying mind to um, the plane differences I see, as well as um, the slight value var variations that I see. Um, as you know, as it, it sort of in the in the middle of the face, like right around, you know, basically in here, eyes around the nose, into the lips, um, cheeks, right here. Things are a little more saturated in color. And then as we move away, basically move around this plane, move off into the distance, um, information gets both a little bit darker in value as well as a little less chromatic and a little cooler. Um, so keeping that in mind, even as I lay down um, these initial flesh and light tones. I always get uh, a little bit of, I don't know, nervousness on putting that first stroke of flesh and light color onto my canvas, thinking to myself, is this going to be the? Is, is this going to be a proper mix? And um, and you know, it, sometimes you put it down and you realize, well, it looked a certain way down here, but um, it's not quite where I want it um, when I you know when I put it on my uh, on my panel. And so you just mix a little mix a little more up. Not a big deal. All right, so. At this moment, I'm kind of, um, you know, I'm thinking about these front planes that I'm mixing, or I mean, sorry, <laughs> front planes that I'm, on which I'm applying paint to. Mainly light. 
weight. Um, notice the, you know, the, the way I'm applying this plane. I'm, this is all front, pain, front plane information. Um, and so, you know, so, so um, I'm applying it as such. Applying front plane. And I've, and I've created, uh, again, slightly different tones here to describe the slightly different uh, planes. And I will hop into, you know, um, hop into my, uh, my original color and make a little adjustment when I, as I see fit. Realizing like, you know, I just want to, maybe I just want to get like a, just a half step of a value darker than what I had. You know, the, the lovely thing about um, spending a fair amount of time on that underpainting is that I've got, I've got this structure that, I've, um, that I'm going to uh, try to stay true to. Just want to get a little, just a wee bit darker in value, I'm realizing, as I move across the flesh and light. So, I mean, you know, as you can see, like, looking at um, Sion and, and watching me apply paint on these areas, like, you know, these are, these are really subtle shifts, which is why when I initially mixed them, um, you know, I kept them, I kept them really, really close, and so I'm still, I'm not, I'm not deviating too much from from that initial uh, attempt. I'm just, um, you know, I'm examining a, everything a little more closely now that I'm spending time with it. There, and see, so yeah, that's just a, a subtly darker, uh, darker one. Just a little, there we go. Still staying in my light. Yeah, I like that. That's a good tone. That is still a light tone. It's just, um, you know, on a, on, a, on a plain turn. So I am still using the same brush, guys. It's a, this is a nice, using a brush um, this size on this surface and, and allows me to um, lay in a, um, a brush stroke that describes like a nice sized area. Um, I'm not, you know, what I'm not doing and what I d discourage people from doing is coloring in. You know, sometimes I see people Doing this kind of thing, they they have a tiny little brush, and they're going like this, <laughs> coloring in an area, and um, 
and it just, um, it's not very clean looking. As we move down her face, um, we get just a little, a little cooler, a little less saturated. And even along this little, um, that turn of form right uh, near her eye is um, slightly, slightly cooler and slightly less saturated. And that whole area, let's see, right um, alongside, <coughs> excuse me, her nose is going to be kind of pretty, a, a, a fairly darker uh, flesh and light tone, bordering on a light um, middle tone. So I'm going to be careful of that, what I put in there. Again, now here we have front plane. That is a uh, bringing in, as you can see, this is where I start my merging into the to the middle, but um, probably right there. Might be a little too light, actually. But uh, that's, yeah. Probably darken that in my next step. But. Let's, let's see here. Ah, look at that. See, it's, it's, you know, you always notice when you put a, when you, when you sort of overshoot it, and I overshot that light on her chin, so let's just uh, withdraw that a little bit, adjust it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I'm just noticing that I, I want to make sure to keep my shadow shapes um, correct there will lightly be some refining of some of those initial initial marks I made um, once you you know once you start adding color and moving into a, um, a subsequent stage uh, it's easy to lose uh, lose some of your nice marks that you made and that's just that just happens naturally. All right, so let me, I'm gonna get now even a bigger brush. Let's 
try this guy. All right, so um, yeah, so let me let me mix up or add a little more paint to this. My um, my mixture for this sort of um, middle-ish light, average light, I should say. See what that looks like. Maybe cool that off a little bit. Maybe add a little bit of my yellow tone. And here I will dip just slightly into some oil and just, um, actually, I do want to um, continue to cool that off a little now that I'm laying it down and seeing how. Uh, warm it is. All right. Okay. So, just basically massing some of this, some of this light in. And I'm noticing, um, you know, as I as I lay some color down, um, you know, no noticing some uh, some variation where I see some slightly pinker, slightly pinker areas, slightly yellow areas, slightly greener areas. So I will um, take that into account as I lay as I um, mass it in. Um, and uh, in this, covering like a pretty vast area like this, um, I'm not so concerned at this moment um, in, you know, really, really getting at um, my chroma, you know, my chroma so spot on. I, I will definitely get to this later. Just, it just um, helps me visually to see some of the, the right value down more than anything. I just notice how I, um, I'm laying down these big strokes uh, um, in with different brush orientations, sort of a flatter area, and I I just want um, some interesting interesting variation before in a, in an area where I don't have to describe a whole lot of movement. I'm getting a lot more of that mix. It's, uh, actually, let me get a little significant more, significantly more down. All right, and now cool it, yellow it. And, and all that stuff gets fairly fairly dark and is definitely different than, than that other flesh, but I'll just, just put a little couple of notes in there. And now, her neck is actually a little darker um, I, w I wouldn't say mid-tone, but it's definitely uh, darker than, than, this, than this chest area. So let me just load up um, or uh, put, get a little more paint in my pile here for that, some of that darker color that I see in her neck. And that could work. And you can see the you know when I when I butt it up to that lighter color, you can definitely can see that that change. Slightly slightly different value. I 
and some of them you can see her uh, her bones, her clavicles, her neck, and that will be something that we want to pay mind to when we when I get more um, in depth in this area later. And then information coming around, or whoops, in that neck area, gets a little warmer in there. Bringing in some of that little bit of warmth. All right, just getting some more paint on the, on the panel. So right, you know, talking about um, um, edges before, um, bringing this information into this information, or I should say kind of like turning this little bit of um, uh, shoulder area and, and that li little bit of the side of her neck and upper, uh, upper shoulder into, um, into, the, into the depth, into the back, I will basically just get a slightly cooler slightly cooler and we'll and I'll be working on that area um, getting into you know more mid-tone information One thing I just want to check. Yes, just kind of just double checking um, myself as to really where that line of her dress would be. It's uh, it's it's never going to be on my on my panel, but I just need need to know for reference. And basically, it's it's the length of her head, the length of or the crown to chin. So it would be all the way down to where my finger is, which, which um, gives me a little bit of um, a marker as to, as to you know, some of the, her, and her uh, topography right about here where I can start, start seeing just like the littlest bit of indentation of where, you know, her, on, beyond her breastbone. So just to give me Give me um, a landmark there. All right. Okay, all right. So this is the initial stage here. Let me, um, I'm gonna look in, look in my little mirror. Again, see how this is looking. Okay, yeah, got some color on there. That'll work.
Hi, I'm Jennifer Balkin and welcome to my workshop. In this workshop, I plan to show you how I use my chromatic limited palette. I love using color. In my own work, I seek to augment um, nature a bit by injecting my paintings with a little more saturated color than really exists. I believe that I can create um, the illusion of a little more vibrancy and, and life uh, than I actually see. In this workshop, I'm going to introduce you to my chromatic limited palette. Using this palette, you'll be able to achieve color harmony effortlessly. You'll be using three main colors plus white, and ultimately you're using all these colors at the same time. So because you're using your entire palette, uh, the effects are quite visually pleasing. One of the most exciting things about this video is that once you can master, uh, work with, and then ultimately master this chromatic limited palette, I really truly believe that you can mix any paint. So I, I think of it as a superpower. Your ability to identify a hue or family of color and then adjust it chromatically and regarding temperature while staying true to value will, will just be something that becomes intuitive to you. I love how she paints. That was Jennifer Balkin and Limited Palette Portraits. If you want to learn more about that, go to lilyartvideo.com. Let's get into her head a little bit now and we'll do an interview. I started painting, or I started just dabbling and uh, when I was in middle school, I believe, uh, I found my grandmother's paints, but I really didn't do much more than that and didn't really get into it until about 2001. I would describe my painting style as expressive realism or contemporary optical mixed realism or something like that. I've always been drawn to painting the human face. It's really what uh, drove me to start painting in the first place. And I find that when I'm painting the face, I'm thinking about the journey and life that person has had up until that point. And so I think about it as actually a map of telling a, telling a story, telling that person's story in paint and emotion. I feel that painting from life or observation is tantamount to learning how to really properly paint the figure or, or face. Uh, it's, it is uh, so important to understand the anatomy, the structure underneath the skin. And um, using uh, any reference that's not from observation is, can be very limiting. Uh, they can be really helpful tools, but I, I truly believe that the only way to improve your skills is to understand how light falls across something uh, from observation. Photos can be really flat, and, uh, and so then once you understand these, this uh, relationship between light and shadow and the structure behind the form that, that you're painting, you've got that knowledge that you can use to fill in any kind of blanks that you see from, uh, when using a reference. I consider myself to be a colorist. Um, I, I love saturated color, and the, the, the thing is, uh, years ago, when I was, I guess, starting out painting, I would use uh, probably about 13 or 14 different colors, and they would pretty much depend on who I was um, uh, studying or um, kind of, I, I guess, uh, uh, mimicking um, at the time. And then at, at, at some point, these, a certain number of colors became my palette. And I, I would think about color relationships fairly technically. Uh, that is, you know, when, when composing a composition, 
I would set out to ensure that my, uh, my palette was split complementary or uh, you know, just really, really thinking about the correct color relationships. And then some years later, when I discovered um, the limited palette, I didn't have to think about those relationships anymore because I was using all of my paints sim simultaneously. And so things, things were harmonious automatically. And, uh, and where I thought that I had a pretty good handle on color before that, uh, I feel much more um, confident and competent about my color relationships now. Staying inspired to paint and make art is not hard for me. I am, I am constantly inspired. I see incredible work through my social media feed every day. Um, and this just, this fuels me, this excites me. I always want to try something a little different and a little new. And so I actually can't not paint <laughs> for too long. And if, it, if I go a little too long without painting, I start feeling blue and uncomfortable. So I, uh, I'm happy to say, at least in this moment in my life, I, I am inspired. I love Jennifer. She's got so much vibrancy and so much energy. And what a great painter. That was Limited Palette Portraits with Jennifer Balkin. You can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. Stay safe. I'm Eric Rhodes. Hi, I'm Jennifer Balkin and welcome to my workshop. In this workshop, I plan to show you how I use my chromatic limited palette. I love using color. In my own work, I seek to augment um, nature a bit by injecting my paintings with a little more saturated color than really exists. I believe that I can create um, the illusion of a little more vibrancy and, and life uh, than I actually see. In this workshop, I'm going to introduce you to my chromatic limited palette. Using this palette, you'll be able to achieve color harmony effortlessly. You'll be using three main colors plus white, and ultimately you're using all these colors at the same time. So because you're using your entire palette, uh, the effects are quite visually pleasing. One of the most exciting things about this video is that once you can master, uh, work with, and then ultimately master this chromatic limited palette, I really truly believe that you can mix any paint. So I, I think of it as a superpower. Your ability to identify uh, hue or family of color and then adjust it chromatically and regarding temperature while staying true to value will, will just be something that becomes intuitive to you.